Hey everybody, good evening and welcome to Fish on Northwest to Wayne England. That there is Kelly Barnum. And that is me. That is you. We'll be joined later in the kitchen as we are each and every week by Chef Kelly Lance O'Neill, the other Kelly of the crew, and his lovely assistant Sherry, of course, with the recipe of the week. And I know what we're doing this week. It's like everything's all about this one fish this week, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of troutiness going on around here. So right. uh, if you've always snubbed your nose upwards when it comes to thinking about eating late-caught trout, well, Chef Kelly has a recipe tonight that's going to blow your mind. So we'll get to that later in the show. Quick shout-out to uh, David over in IT Corner making this whole thing work. And or if it screws up, it all falls on him. Yep. So yep. we'll take that. He's uh, been stressing a little bit today. so You know, getting ready for this tonight, <laughs> I kind of throwing some different stuff at him to say, hey, I want to see if we can do this. And he's kind of like, it's, it's scrambling his little nugget over there. So that's all, <laughs> you know, that's all right. Uh, he loves to be challenged, and he does a fantastic job for us each and every week. So, hey, uh, Fish Hunt Northwest is presented by Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate Pacific Commons, located in Puyallup, Washington. We thank them for... Uh, their support and helping us get this off the ground. So check out uh, Better Homes and Gardens, Pacific Commons, if you're uh, looking for a home. We will once again feature our home of the week later on the show for you to take a look at. Uh, along with that, if you're joining us live here tonight, we're simulcast, of course, as we do each and every week, on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. And our numbers slowly ticking up their bottom yeah. on our YouTube channel, right? Yeah, we're very excited about the response we're getting from you guys. Very yeah. excited. Yeah. So I'll keep uh, keep following us each week. Just keep throwing those uh, those links out there. Get people drawn over to our YouTube page, and so they start subscribing there, and they can not just catch our show live every week, but all the additional videos and content we're going to continue to load up. And as we get more outdoors here, and as the spring's hitting here, we got a whole list of things we're going to be out doing that you're going to want to pay attention to. So lots of in the field and on the water stuff. Lots of how tos. Lots of just getting out and having a good time and showing you a lot of opportunity we have here in Washington State. So. Again, follow us on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and of course our Instagram is live up and well, and uh, posting lots of information. We really uh, enjoy and appreciate the interaction with you guys throughout the week on our Facebook page. Barnum and I go through a lot of uh, effort to put up pertinent information, right. albeit some of it's uh, a little on the political side, but doggone it, every day we turn around, there's something happening yeah. that we got to be... On right. top of. Sportsmen have to stay connected and you have to understand the issues that are in front of us because there's been never in history a time like now where we're being attacked on all fronts. Yeah. I mean, just fishing, hunting. I mean, we always heard the anti-hunting agenda has been strong forever, but now yeah. we're really starting to see this anti-hatchery agenda, yeah. agenda being propped up to a whole new level and we have to stay informed and we have to stay involved. When large corporate monies that are relevant in companies that make their the, the bulk of their money in the outdoor industry are coming to the table with their bank account to yep. fight hatchery production. We have serious concerns going on right. in the Pacific Northwest. We're gonna get into that a little later. If you're not quite sure, you know, I did I threw a post up a few days ago on our Facebook page, Boycott Patagonia, for right. good reason. Right. And uh, if you're not on, on board on that train yet, we're gonna make sure by the end of this show between now and 8 p.m. that you fully understand what's going on there. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, hey, before we get that, uh, two days from now, Saturday is yep. the Lowland Lake Trout Opener. Last week in the Bay Lab, took you through a number of options to utilize on your lakes for this weekend and throughout the season, an opportunity to go get some of those planter rainbows that the, uh, the department, WDFW, puts out millions, literally right. millions right. of trout. Right. We posted links this week on the Facebook page yes, for sure. Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. So you can easily go to those links on our Facebook page, scroll down, find the state you're in, click on it, and every lake, every pond, every place they're going to plant a trout is listed <laughs> and tell you exactly where it's at. Yeah. And, you know, right here in our backyard, Summit Lake opens this Saturday. We're getting 5,000 that are getting dumped off tomorrow. Make sure that people can come out and have an opportunity. 500 jump. Those, yeah. those are pretty nice sized trout. And we actually get a pretty good holdover population out here oh, that I get excited about every year. And those things eat phenomenal. You get those holdover rainbows with that nice red meat. Yeah. They've been eating all the little scuds, the chronomids, and all that stuff yeah. that's really a good protein source for them. Right. In a healthy lake with lots of feed, those trout, they may jump, get dumped in there as a planter a couple years ago, but you get some of the nice holdovers, 15 right. to 18 inches. That's a good eating right. little fish, right? Right, so, and there's other opportunities to hop out and do some fishing this weekend, but this is the busiest fishing day yeah. of the year, and it's kind of looking like, which we'll go into a little more later on in this segment, but it's looking like this is going to be a great weekend to hit the lakes. Weather-wise. Really is, right? yeah. Weather-wise, yeah. the fish will be there, get the kids out. Uh, most 
adults who were fishing today, their first encounter was with a rainbow. Absolutely. A WDFW planted rainbow in some lake somewhere here in western and eastern Washington or down there in Oregon or Idaho, wherever you're at. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, the Long Island right. Lake opener is happening. That's why later in the show, in the kitchen with Chef Kelly and Sherry, he's doing a rainbow recipe. And uh, we have to give props to the little gentleman who provided that trout. Uh, Chef Kelly and I were up steelhead fishing last week up north. And um, we, on our drive home, uh, well, just a handful of days ago, uh, little Isaac Barr, our good buddy Mike Barr, he lives yep. over there by American Lake. Uh, his four-year-old son, it was his birthday. What do you want for your birthday, Isaac? I want a new fishing pole and a tackle box, Daddy. So Mike takes them down to Sportco. They get the gear. They come home, take them out fishing. Lo and behold, catches that nice rainbow that you're going to see later on that Chef Kelly has all filleted out, prepped up, ready to go. And uh, he, Mike asked him, hey, you want to give this fish to Dwayne and the guys for, uh, for to be on Fish on Northwest? Awesome. He was like, yeah. So wow. there you go. Four-year-old got his first trout on his right. birthday. Parenting uh, done right. Absolutely, right. it all came together, and you know what? That's that's just another uh, that's just another right. little fishing I, junkie I right think there. Dad's pocketbook's probably going to take the brunt of that for the next few years, <laughs> but hey, like twelve or fourteen, time. yeah, yeah, he did a nice job. So four-year-old provides the fish that Chef Kelly got to cook up, which is pretty awesome. awesome. Uh, hey, if anybody cares, by the way, Barnum, if you're not doing nothing, you probably got baseball this weekend. But the Columbia is open this weekend. Another opener for right. Spring Chinook. The flows, the levels are dropping down, but last we checked with a few friends and whatnot that are down there and fish that repeatedly, the turbidity right. is off the charts. Right, I was told today, I reached out real quick to kind of get a forecast for it, what it's gonna be like. I was told to stay home, that visibility is gonna be between six to, three to six inches. So, I mean, hmm. you are gonna have to bump a springer in the nose to Absolutely. catch Absolutely. That being said, it was probably near that last weekend, I was being told somewhere around 12 inches. And there was still 88 springers caught yeah. from what I was, from what I see yeah, online. So, yeah. I mean, you still can catch fish. And any day on the water is better than mowing the lawn. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. But that being said, uh, you and I were talking before the show. It looks like there's some information kind of getting bounced around out there in the old interwebs that the uh there may be potential openings like we're talking you know as we roll into may mid yep. mid may yep. water levels are going to be down temperatures are going to come up get rid of that cold water that right. snow melt's going to be kind of you know we'll start getting some warmth getting that ideal temperatures and you get some visibility get back to three four six feet of visibility and lo and right. behold Springer fishing could be good. Right. We may even drag the boat down and go after them for yeah, a Yeah, springers in May are, I mean, that's springer season. That's you know, truly springer trying season. Trying to fish them in March Springers in April. February, oh, not so man, much, right? No. Uh, I am going springer fishing tomorrow, by the way, but uh, was it last week? Two weeks ago. Did a uh, presentation for you guys in the Bay Lab on tributary springers, bobber and bait presentation. Right. Going to go take advantage of that tomorrow with a couple of buddies and uh, get out on the water, see if we can't find a few. Not very much opportunity out there as far as locations of where to go right could be crowded we'll see but there is an opportunity nonetheless got to take advantage of it i haven't gone after a springer yet this year right this is one of those fisheries i at least put in a handful of days every year right towards the opening of trout season that's when i start fishing springers if i'm not taking the boat out on the columbia if it's not you know worth my time dragging down there then i just look for the tributary opportunity we right. still have that and some of these opportunities will fish good for those springers all the way through yeah. june Right. So it's not over yet, and we'll see what the numbers do. If we start getting decent numbers in those tribs, yeah. it could be pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we're really getting ready to go full steam into fishing season. I mean, the springers yep. are rolling now. Yep. I mean, we got the lakes are opening up. Yep. Sturgeon openers right around the corner. Good Halibut point. openers right here. I mean, bottom fishing in the ocean, like, spring is here. Summer steelhead in June. Yeah. I mean, that'll be here before we know it. Right. So. Lots of opportunity that we're going to take advantage of, and somehow we're going to find time to get that turkey hunt in. It, right. You know, oh, for sure. We're yeah, going to. we're late yeah. to the turkey call, but we'll right, get there, right? right? Well, commitments. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, hey, speaking of ocean and bottom fish, Lincod reports. Um, what are you hearing? What do you know? Uh, so just kind of following, I follow four or five different charter boats online mm -hmm. on on Facebook, and they do a really good job of keeping you updated on you know how the fishing's been. Right. We know the charter boats go out there, and they almost always consistently catch their rockfish. You know, they do a really good job of that. Yep. But you can really kind of track that lean cod bite by what you're seeing coming from those four or five different boats. And the last week or so, I mean, it's been pretty steady, double digit numbers of lean cod, 
almost consistently limits for number of people fishing and it's really looking like that lean cod bite is really picking up you know what's crazy is you think you know these turbo boats go out day after day right. season after season and in some of our ocean those, those fisheries stay open until october yeah and you're like my god how yeah can it sustain that much pressure but right and they the do numbers are there right and some of the up, the more up close rock piles that you know aren't as far offshore they do get hammered down a little bit and become tougher and tougher to fish as the weeks go on right but and in the charter boats will consistently start to move a little farther offshore but i mean there are still and i'm going to discuss one here in a little, little bit but there are still places very close to port mm -hmm. that you can catch some really really nice quality lean cod yeah right. you want to jump on that now or yeah you... let's jump on it david uh, one of my favorite places to fish, and I'm going to hop up here and go to the computer screen, and David's going to throw it up, is, come on now, okay, so this is, of course, my home port that I go to is Westport, and one of my favorite places to fish, which can be a little tricky to access, is the tip of the South Jetty. So this here is Westport. If we come out of the marina and we swing around, if you stick to the south there, you're gonna see the South Jetty. Most people know, but you know, a lot of people that don't fish this area a lot don't know that off the tip of the jetty, there's a sunken jetty that continues out. That's where you see this white water here. It continues out for probably, oh, I'm estimating here, but probably close to two miles. Uh, in that area right there, when tides are right, when I like to fish this, like I was saying before, on the off tides, uh, when you go into your tide book and you look at your tide book, or I use saltwatertides.com right here, and you can pull up the tides, you go through kind of what they set up there, Westport, Point Chehalis, and you can get all your tides right there. I like to fish those off tides. The tides where you're only getting from low water to high water, you're getting four or five feet of water change. Not the big minuses where you're seeing 10 or 11 feet because that's really gonna affect the current. And current is the enemy right here on this sunken jetty. The sunken jetty probably runs about maybe 100 yards wide. And it's a really quick drift unless you fish it more towards the slack waters. How deep of water are you fishing? You're gonna fish, you're gonna start out fishing what we like to do as I'm, as I'm side drifting across the jetty, you're gonna be in about 50 feet of water. You're gonna see the jetty start to show up on your graph and you're gonna see it's gonna come up to about 14 feet of water. Huh. We do not drop lines into the rocks until we know we're at the crest of the jetty. You do not wanna fish the wall coming up because you are just going to lose your gear. Yeah. You're gonna hang it up in the rocks because you're dragging it as you're drifting and you're gonna lose your gear. Because you're going from a low point up. Yes. So it's just gonna yes. grab everything. Yep, yep. So oh, as you hit the crest sense. of the jetty, yeah. I, I, as the crest of the jetty, I'm usually watching the graph and I yell bombs away. <laughs> and everybody starts to drop. We love to drop crescent weights here. We will drop the half moon sinkers and that's what we use. We've tried just about every single style of sinker there. You only need to run about four ounces because you're fishing so shallow. And we've tried almost every single style of sinker and the, the crescent weight, the banana weight, some people call it, tends to not hang up. Oh. I don't know why. I, I don't know what the difference is, but it doesn't seem to get stuck between the rocks as much. Yeah. And we'll just jig a herring on like a two foot leader and the trick is as soon as you feel touch on bottom get it back up you do not want that bait to, that sinker to spend time on the rocks tap bottom up tap bottom up work your way across the top of the jetty as you start to slide off of the jetty what i do is i'm using a bait caster i click it i keep my spool free mm -hmm. and i'll just feed line on every jig to make sure that I'm, I'm staying in contact with the bottom as it rolls back down. So how long a liter is that? Uh, running only about a two to three foot liter Any at most. Ounces the, of weight you said? Uh, um, four to six, yeah, okay. depending on tide. Ten on tide. Uh, one thing to remember with the sunken jetty. Now, this really can be one of the most dangerous parts of the Westport Bar. Yeah. I mean, people, people sink their boats here all the time yeah. and die. Be smart with it. You have to be so graphic. Yeah, they do. I mean, I mean, I'm being serious. Yeah, From the captain's point of view, I'm being yeah, yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. We move out towards the tip of the jetty. We kind of, 
we kind of look at it, we evaluate the sunken jetty before we move out to it. If it looks calm enough to fish, we'll kind of work our way out there and start fishing it. Yep. If it by any means look like it's not calm enough to fish, we'll just stick around the tip of the jetty and stay on the bay side of the jetty and just work that edge. And you'll pick up some fish there too. If I'm researching my weather information, yes. my wind waves, yes. my basically my ocean yeah. forecast, and I've, you know, so I don't want to exceed a tide that's maybe more than a five foot exchange. Yeah, for sure. And I don't want to be out there with over a swell and a wind wave of what? I, I usually try to stay, if I'm going to fish the sunken jetty, I'm looking for something that's five foot and under. Okay. Like five foot at 10, five foot at 12, yeah. you know, something under that. Yeah. I, I kind of cut it off. I, you see a lot, you'll see six foot at nine seconds. Yep. I don't go on those days to the oh, sunken okay. jetty. Like it just, and like I said, just be smart about it. Don't take any chances out there because, I mean, you'll see if you start fishing it. That white water that I showed you on the graph, those are probably 14, 15 foot breakers yeah. that the satellite image is picking up. I mean, it is Hawaii Five-O out there. At yeah. And if it's sketchy, just stay out of there. Yeah. I mean, it can be good if the conditions are right, right but don't risk it. Right. And there's yeah. great lean cod there. I mean, we've caught 15 pound lean cod there. Yeah. And you're, you know, a mile from port. Nothing you wrong know, with you're that. You're talking a gallon of gas <laughs> yeah. and a, a limit of lean cod. Not have to run yeah, yeah. half yeah. the day to go get them. Nice. Right. Okay. Well done. Um, uh, let's see. Some other things going on. You know, uh, I called you the other day and I went to Olympia. Right. I don't know why. I went to Olympia. You're glutton for punishment. Oh, my God. So, well, there's a lot of things going on relative to fee increases. The House and the Senate both are trying to pass through bills, uh, kind of trying to come up with ways or means of providing monies for WDFW. The problem is that, once again, they want to put this on the shoulders of the recreational folks, hunters and fishers. Right. Um, now, I get it. We haven't had a fee increase since 2011. The last time WDFW went to legislators and they said, hey, we're looking at a fee increase, they told them, well, we're going to audit and see how your finances are being utilized. We want to take care of any waste, to cut any waste that right. you guys are you know, continuing to do. Well, lo and behold, they got done with that after a year plus process and they were like, wow. You guys are actually screwed down pretty tight. Well, that's good to hear. There's not a lot of waste going on, and the monies that are allocated for certain projects and, you know, the ones that are going to fisheries and for hatcheries, and the money's being used appropriately. Right. Uh, to include, you know, scientific data gathering, all those things. Uh, so here we are again. WDFW is kind of handcuffed in trying to move forward in providing opportunity, uh, running hatcheries, upgrading hatcheries. Now we have this whole you know several points of contention we have to provide enough salmon for the orcas we right. have an out of control pinniped predation problem we got a bird issue barnum you and i talk about nobody's really even Nobody it doesn't seem to be on anybody's radar but it's a, a huge concern uh there's a lot of things going on with management some would refer to as mismanagement lack of information lack of transparency the agency hears it all um but i i come back and look at our government and say you know, they, they sliced the budget immensely in tw uh, 2008. Yep. There were major cutbacks with the recession. It carried on through 2010. Some agencies and government got their money back and are fully funded or 90 plus percent funded. There's things happening in government at different levels that, hey, you know what, it's, it's back, times are good. When it comes to WDFW and providing opportunity for us to be out on the water in the woods and doing what we love to do, which provides billions of dollars for our state, and yet we go over there into Olympia, here's this room of representatives, they're sitting there talking about fee increases. Now, there was one group represented that was for the fee increases, Trout Unlimited, go figure. <laughs> the, the majority, NSIA, CCA, PSA, all your well-known, well-supported groups uh, comprised of thousands, thousands of persons that love to fish our waters. Right. They're representatives of those each agencies and departments are there to say, we do not um, support fee increases. Part of that is we don't want to, we don't want to give the commission monies for bad behavior. And they're referring to that poor decision-making process right. relevant to the Columbia River Gilnet reform rollback. Right. People are very irritated over the Columbia River endorsement, years of paying that fee, and then the agreements that we came up with, the reason we were paying the fee at the tail end of it, are yanked from us. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I totally understand yeah. that. Or, Oregon right now, the, Governor Kate Brown has decimated the, the right. commission. 
She's replaced five positions, which four of them were up for either being replaced or being reappointed. Right. One of them, Buckmaster, he had another year, and she's like, nope, you're out of here. Right. So out of their seven, unlike Washington, we have nine. Down in Oregon, they have seven. Five of them are new faces. In June, mid-June, and I remember talking with Cody last week, yep. Yep. they're up against a vote that they have to consider of where, what direction they're going to go with the Columbia River reform. Uh, that'll be very interesting. We'll they keep eyes on that. They got into a firestorm, didn't they? Holy wow. cow. I don't envy those people, but I mean, I think... Hopefully, <clears throat> Governor Brown was in response to what she saw happening yeah. and said, no, we can't allow yeah. this, that the Northwest has been built upon fishing, right. and we have to make changes that are going to protect that. So, so not to steer too far away from it, the, uh, the bottom line here is the reason these organized groups are not in favor of fee increases, understand, they are in favor of funding the yeah. agency. They're in favor of funding the department, WDFW. Right. Everybody's in favor of them getting money so they can do what needs to be done relative to managing hunting and fishing in the state of Washington once again. They don't have money to hardly do anything. Right. Uh, for those that honestly think that WDFW has just got this bad habit of wasting money, I can tell you uh, that's already been proven. You know, and that, that is something, I mean, we kind of get into the weeds, but I ain't going to go yeah. digging into all that no. stuff. I'm not no. going to go, oh, they're fleecing of America and all that. I, right. I'm taking the words of those that have done the studies and provided the documentation right. to say, look, that above board, things look pretty good. Bottom line is they're 30 plus million dollar shortfall. It's very hard to manage a household on a, you know, budget that is a couple thousand dollars in the, in the red. Right. Uh, or a construction right. company. Right. Or, yeah, you, you know, just can't do it. You or or keep do the it. doors open on this studio. You <laughs> so have to, right. You, you just can't do it. Right. You have to start cutting non-essential items. Yep. Unfortunately, with this is a time where this is important because we see the attacks that are on hatcheries yep. and the lawsuits and stuff that are rolling out one yep. after another after another. And all those lawsuits, for the most part, tend to see, you know, they get settled out of court, which costs lots of money. And so you can see WDFW starting to turn in a direction to avoid litigation. And that is scary. Now, I read online an interesting number that the state of Washington actually had over an $800 million surplus this year. Yeah. And so... Why can't we use some of that surplus money to fund a budget that is essential, especially in a state where a Democrat majority rules who claim to be champions of conservation right. and environmental climate yep. change and everything yep. else? Yep. Why is that? Why is that legislator not funding? Because people forget WDFW is not just about hunting and fishing. It's about mm -hmm. conservation and protecting yep. wildlife and protecting <clears throat> our resources. Our governor needs to step up, our legislature needs to step up and fund our fish and wildlife. Here's the agency. irony. Our governor assembles this task force, they work a task force. Right. They spend months and months gathering data, picking on the minds of those that are in the know, marine biologists, uh, scientists, uh, right. persons within the department, um, those that represent fishing groups. I mean, there, there were a lot of folks at the table for this, yeah. tribal, tribal representation. It affects everybody. It, his initial announcement of his budget proposal was in the billions for salmon and orca recovery. They had in the millions for upgrading hatcheries in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. They want a surplus 18.6 million more Chinook into Puget Sound, which equates on a 1% return to 186,000 Chinook returning right. to Puget Sound waters to feed the orcas. And yes, recreational fishers do receive obviously some benefit out of that. Yeah. But so does the economy overall. Absolutely. Throughout major metropolitan Puget Sound, you got salmon fishing, you know, back in the heyday. Right. Of persons buying licenses, gear, boat sales, the whole thing, right? It just, it, it snowballs. So over here, we're saying, hey, we need all this money. Here's our, here's our proposal. Here's our plan. And you go sit in on a budget hearing with our representatives, and they're going back and forth on fee increases that are going to equate to $14.3 million. Right. You put these in place, and by the way, the Senate and the House don't have common language, so, and we're coming up at the end of the session here this weekend, I believe. I think so. So they have to fast track and get common language to even push these through. Um, there are those that have said, hey, this thing is kind of fast tracking, so hold on. I don't really care if it's fast tracking, right. Barnum. Right. You know, the answer isn't to hit the recreational. Don't get us wrong. We're in favor of funding WDFW. Right. Everybody is. Right but not out of our pockets anymore. Give them the money back that they deserve out of the general fund and quit holding them hostage yep. and expecting them to do so right. much more with so much less. 
Our population has exploded the last 37 years. We've more than doubled our population in the state of Washington. Right. And, and the a, economy in the state of Washington has been booming with the tech industry coming here. Especially the last I couple mean, years, right. things have been on the uptick. So, right. And I just hate to see if we, if we continue to have these fee increases, fee increases, we do nothing but shorten and shorten the pool of mm -hmm. people that want to hunt and fish. You, can't, you, you, you force them to go, I ain't buying a license right. anymore. So really, at that point, I hear that all yep. the time online. Every time yep. we post a story about fee increases, we read the comments. Yeah. I'm done if it's this. I'm, I'm done. done if it's this. I'm fishing out of and, state. I'm hunting out of state. Right. I'm done. And as cool as empty woods and empty rivers sound when it comes to hunting and fishing, that is not the future of hunting and fishing. No. We will lose everything we have if we don't continue to grow the user base. Contact your state representatives and your senators. Tell them to fully fund WDFW for the future of our fisheries and hunting opportunity, your kids, your grandkids. This has got to stop. It has to. It absolutely has to stop. They need money. Their hands are tied. Contact your representatives and your senators and tell them that the time is now to fully fund WDFW and quit dragging your feet and quit putting it back on our shoulders because we're tired of it. And that's probably enough to beat up on that one. But yep. It really just kind of pisses me off. Yeah. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had a little bit, uh, uh, but, you know, I'm up to here on this crap. Right. So, uh, all right, with that, we are going to jump out for a break. We come back, we're going to go into the bait lab. Now, we're coming up on halibut season. Our guests yep. tonight failed to mention at the start of the show because we're so wrapped up in trout fishing. Uh, John Beath, uh, uh, Pro Squid uh, Tackle. Squid Pro Tackle, excuse me, Salmon Chronicles, Halibut Chronicles, SquidLures.com. He's been a phenomenal outdoor writer for 30 plus years. If you haven't heard John Beath, you're living under a rock. He's gonna join us later in studio for the rest of the show as always. Uh, tons of halibut information to go over. We're talking lures, we're talking approach, we're talking yeah. areas to go. We're talking about opportunities here and up in Canada. I mean, wealth of knowledge. Get your questions ready either on Facebook or YouTube. We're gonna to try to answer as many as we can when we have John in the studio. But before we get there, one of my favorite baits to utilize for halibut fishing is rainbow trout. And every time I put this post out, Barnum, I get <laughs> hammered by people going, that's illegal, you right. can't do that. Trust me, last year when I wrote this blog for Potskis, I checked with WDFW and the regulations, and you certainly can use trout and, oh, by the way, kokanee, if you're willing to give up your kokanee, right. people go, well, when is a halibut ever going to eat a kokanee? Well, right. sockeye swim in the ocean, just saying. Right. So you can cure up and utilize rainbow trout and kokanee for halibut bait. And if you cure them up, give them some tremendous UV, toughen them up with some salts and some liquid in a brine, you'd be amazed at how well they work. It's one of my favorite baits to fish. And we're going to show you how to do that in the bait lab, curing up some trout, Later on, we're cooking up some trout. Tonight, we're curing up some trout. <laughs> when we come back right here on FHN.
skies waving goodbye She come out to break the night Leaving no traces around her She's trying to free, she's trying to free a reckless heart She's trying to be a slide, slide out some breeze Hey, welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We are now in the bait lab and we're gonna talk a little bit about, well, all this green stuff. No, it's not antifreeze. We're gonna cure up some rainbow trout for halibut bait. Yes, again, you can use rainbow trout and kokanee. And if you think kokanee, that's blasphemous. Uh, you catch some 11 and maybe 12 inch kokanee and you got a whole pile of them. Maybe five to 10 of them you don't wanna flay out and deal with, right, David? So we're gonna turn those into bait because they work really good. Problem is, how, uh, kokanee especially can be a little bit on the soft side, trout can as well. We just need to toughen them up a little bit. If we're going to brine them and toughen them up, we might as well add a tremendous amount of UV. UV never hurts. And as we get deeper into this show, we sit down with John Beath, you're going to realize exactly how, um, how far UV has come in the industry of where it started and where we've gone with it. So the fact we can add UV to baits is just a bonus that Again, if you're gonna brine them up, you might as well add some color that they can see down the dark. So I have actually some rainbow from last year. Caught them out here in the lake and just throw them in the Ziploc bag in the freezer. Don't have to take a whole lot of real good care of them. Don't clean them, because the guts and everything in there is what makes these such a, a tasty bait that the uh, halibut really like. So there's a few things. This is very simple to do. Now, three of these have already pre-cut. So uh, looking overhead here, I just basically take a rainbow trout and I put uh, a couple slashes in each side of it. Uh, some of the bigger ones, I'll put three. All I'm doing is opening up that meat a little bit. It really doesn't take the bait and make it to where it doesn't perform well. I open up that meat just a tad and as it sits in the brine, believe it or not, it just seems to get more of the salts and the curing agent into the meat of these trout and really firms them up real nice so they're just not falling apart as they're bouncing around there on the bottom, okay? So that's really the simple part. Just put a couple slices uh, in those, those trout, open up the meat, get the salts in there. Now, we're gonna take our tub here. I have poured into here one bottle of Chartreuse Potsky's Fire Brine. It's a, it's a liquid brine, it cures meat baited fish, it's engineered we engineered this years ago for herring, and uh, they use it over in the Great Lakes for alewives. Um, you can pretty much cure any type of meat. We also do eggs with it, but ideally it's made for fish and fish baits. So 
Two colors that I would recommend using when you're out in your ocean fisheries for sure. Chartreuse, out of all the firebrines, has the highest properties of UV. Um, there's actually uh, pictures I put out on the blogs that under a black light, the things look like they've been to Chernobyl and back. They glow tremendously, okay? So that is what you'll get out of the chartreuse. The dark green, believe it or not, is a close second because of the properties in here in making both of these brines are very similar with the dyes and the UV that's captured in this. So the dark green, which I rely on heavily in some of our Grays Harbor uh, fisheries for both Coho and Chinook when we have opportunity, uh, this dark green sometimes outperforms the Chinook, or excuse me, the uh, chartreuse. But when it comes to the deep waters of halibut and the darkness down there, I'm gonna go with the most bang for the butt, buck. The most UV I can get is out of this, um, out of this chartreuse. So I have one bottle poured in here. Basically with this, because I really want these things to firm up nicely, I'm just gonna put in a cup and a half of non-iodized sea salt. Now, it looks like a lot, okay? But uh, it eventually breaks down and absorbs just by letting these trout lay in this stuff for a couple, three days. It ends up doing a pretty nice job. You, I would never use this much salt on herring or smaller bait fish that I wanna use for salmon, but this is, you know, again, I'm trying to toughen these buggers up to send them down to four to 600 feet or beyond. Um, I think John told me they were fishing halibut a thousand feet. Uh, something I don't wanna do. Okay, um, something else I add, Potsky's liquid krill, or you can use the uh, powdered, okay, just a little tougher to mix this in. Uh, in my blog, I was using the powder. I think I put two to three tablespoons. It's just, <clears throat> excuse me, just as easy to get a bottle of liquid. Uh, of the liquid krill, dump that in. Now you don't have to, it's not like an absolute must, but I guarantee you I've had more productivity in most of my ocean fisheries when I add a good krill scent or base into that. Something about the krill, and you'll see that it kind of turns this a little bit of a dingy brown. It doesn't matter. The UV properties are still in the brine. The chartreuse is still in the brine. It's not gonna change the color and the outcome of your uh, baits whatsoever. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to add a tremendous amount of UV and color. The Potsky's Fire Dye. Now the nice thing about any of these liquid products and these dyes and brines, it's 100% food uh, quality or food grade types of dyes and powders that they put into this. So it's not harmful to the environment at all. You get some pretty strange looks if you have your little tote of UV brine on your boat and when you're done fishing for the day you just throw that out into the out into the water or off the dock or something and you get this tremendous cloud it looks like a parachuter just came out and landed in the water but it doesn't uh, affect uh, mother nature whatsoever because it's all 100 percent natural so no worries there this stuff is extremely potent in color but i put in two full tablespoons of the fire dye matter of fact that bottle is about empty so we'll just put that in there that's going to add a tremendous amount of UVs. So we have one bottle of fire brine, which I may add the second one as well, depending on how these sit in this tub. And you can pick whatever you know, size tub you want. The key here, four or five trout, I'm using a bottle of fire brine, two tablespoons of the fire dye, one bottle of the liquid krill powder, and a cup and a half of the uh, non-iodized sea salt. And you just lay these in here. Now, if I don't want to spend the extra money, and I'm doing this over a couple day period, if I don't want to spend the extra money on a second bottle of fire brine, I can literally let those sit in there just like this. And they're basically curing on the one side down in the salt in the, in the liquid stuff, and that's fine. In about a day or so in my fridge, I'd come out and flip these over and uh, get the other side cured up. But uh, I tend to have a little bit of this stuff at my disposal. Um, when I keep David from taking it out of my storage room. I'm just gonna dump this in here to where these buggers are almost floating. But you know, kind of like when you're curing or brining herring, because of the salts in there, you know, these things will float. And of course, they're not gutted. Um, so they're, they're basically a little bit buoyant. But um, that amount of salt in there with two bottles of fire brine is gonna do a real nice job. I will literally let those sit in there for a couple days, come out, flip them over, at the end of a couple, three days, you're going to notice that, uh, unlike using the green, which would turn these predominantly really dark green, 
Uh, they're just going to have a nice light, uh, bright kind of fluorescent green to their white bellies. The sides of their gill plates will take on a little bit of color. Their fins will take on a little bit of color. Don't be alarmed that you think that maybe they haven't taken on enough color and they're not going to have a whole bunch of UV. The UV in the brine is soaked into the meat. You put them under a black light, I guarantee these things are going to glow like crazy. So pretty simple little recipe for curing up your rainbow trout, toughening them up, make them a phenomenal uh, halibut bait. They work really well and it's very simple. Again, put the cuts in the side, open them up a little bit so the salts and the cures get in there. Use your chartreuse, get some of that fire dye to really add some pop to it and send those buggers down and hold on because halibut absolutely love trout. So with that, uh, you know what? I forgot to look, but I think I know what we're doing next. I think I do. We're gonna jump out for a quick commercial break. We come back, we're gonna be back in the studio and our guest John Beeth is gonna be here. We're really gonna dive into some finite information. Get your questions ready relative to halibut. Get your notepads ready and take notes because this guy is a wealth of knowledge. John Beeth right here in the studio. We come back right here on FHN.
Turn it on. You might have to adjust camera one. No, it's, it's, no. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right, we are back. We may have to reset that camera. John came running in here and basically pile drived into that sucker. Uh, hold on. I apparently left my phone on too, Barnum. You know, this is... Uh, this is great. You know, we've had now, this is what, show six? Yeah. So we've had like... 20 commercial breaks, yep. and we've never had this scramble like we just had. Now, this is live TV, baby. Man, this is why we do this. It's just too much fun. I uh, would like to introduce to everybody John Beef. Uh, if you don't know who he is, I had mentioned before, Squid Pro Tackle, Salmon Chronicles, Halibut. I told you, when we talked on the phone, I finally got caught up here last week. I'm going to have to write all this down because you got just way too much going on. Squidlures.com, outdoor writer for years. If you haven't read, read. If you have not read... <laughs> any of his stuff you're missing out uh, you guide up in alaska starting june for halibut yep i mean so be you live out in squim i live in god's paradise and 16 inches of rain a year how long did it take you to get here two and a half hours two hours ten minutes okay that's not too bad no. not too bad so welcome welcome to the studio welcome well, thanks yeah one of the things i really want everyone to understand about halibut is a couple of things first off Anchoring is by far the best method of trying to catch a halibut. Is that right? And after you learn what I'm going to tell you, you yeah. will understand. Yeah. The International Pacific Halibut Commission has done extensive studies. Right. And by the way, I'm on the conference board and I go to the meetings and help, you know, try and get us as much as we can. Dave Kroonquest and I go and do that for PSA and CCA, yeah. so we're really heavily involved. But I've gotten to know the scientists there and I've been reading their stuff for years. But one of the studies they did showed that halibut will come into a scent trail from a mile away. Wow. No so kidding. if you anchor your boat up and you set up so that you have a scent field that's either on the level mm -hmm. or what I like is going down because a lot of times those halibut are in deeper water and you're trying to attract them. Yep. So when I'm looking for a place to go and fish for halibut mm -hmm. and anchor specifically, I try to find a spot that is down slope. And I'm always thinking in terms of how far down slope. So we know that they can smell out your bait from a mile away. Yeah. One of the questions I get at my seminars is, how long should I wait? How long should I sit on anchor? Nothing's happened for an hour. Let's do the math. How deep of water are we anchoring in? Anywhere from 30 feet to I've anchored up in Alaska, you know, in 800 or 1,000. Would you We're say not you, doing that here. You spend more days on anchor going after halibut than not? 95% of my time is, is on that anchor. Right? Well, I had no idea it was that much. It's, yeah, and there's reasons to drift, and I'll get into that later. Sure. But So if you anchor and you've got a knot of current, or let's just say one mile an hour, yep. it's going to take an hour for that halibut that's a mile away to smell your, your offering. Good point. So then how fast does he swim? Well, nobody can determine that because all halibut are different. How excited are they? So let's just say another hour to get back. So that's another hour and then an hour to work the area. So three hours is what you should give any anchored spot. Hmm. Okay. So that also goes back to when should I go? Do I need to go when it's running really hard? And what we found is it's going to be much easier if you don't have a, a strong current flow. Makes sense. Makes easier sense. to stay on anchor. Right. Just like in a river, on, it's easier to stay on anchor in a right. river when you're well, out in the faster water, you know. Now, is, yeah. there a set, is there a special way you're setting up your anchor system? Or That's a very good point. So, in the old days, people used to say, yeah, you need a seven-to-one road, road being your anchor line. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, for every foot of, of depth, you need seven feet. No, the Coast Guard doesn't even go by that. Okay. And what they recommend now, uh, we don't even go by because we're not leaving our boat and going to shore. We're not going to sleep. We're there. We know if there's a problem. We know if it's going to drag anchor. Right. Mm. So what I recommend is your depth plus one-third. So if you're in 300 feet of water, you mm -hmm. need 400 feet of anchor right. line. Okay. The other part of the equation is you need to have chain that equals the length of your boat. Yeah. yeah. So then you got to start looking at the anchor. <clears throat> what style of anchor am I going to use? And people have all kinds of, of styles of anchors. Mm -hmm. I see Columbia River anchors, which, by the way, work pretty good out oh, there. Oh, they do. The kind of anchor that does not work very well 
is a plow anchor. Right. Plow anchors uh. absolutely suck out there. They just don't work. So we're using Bruce anchors. Hmm. And on my 21 foot bay liner, mm -hmm. it's a heavy boat. I'm using a 22 pound anchor. Oh well. It's, a, it's bigger than what most people use. But I bring that up because if you have the ring style system, what happens if you, you get hung up? Because we're not attaching to the end of the anchor. Here's the anchor down here. We're not attaching here. We're attaching down here with, yeah. A, yeah. with a shackle and then bringing the anchor line up here and we're tying on mm -hmm. so that yep. if you get stuck, you pull ahead, break it free. Break it free. Right. But yep. if you're on a ring, what happens? Mm. It doesn't go through there, right. so it keeps dropping back down. Yep. So your anchor chain needs to weigh more than your anchor. Yeah. But I was going to ask you how much you think that everything 21 weigh more. feet of chain weighs. Well, you want to make sure that your anchor chain weighs more, or use a device like an Easy Marine. That's right. what I use. It yep. has a little puller, which makes it easier. Yep. And that way, you can stop if you got a dead head or mm -hmm. another boat in your way. You can stop, bring your line in, and it works really well that Are way. You, uh, so we're anchored up. We're 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 casting, broadcasting sent downstream. Basically, we know which direction our current's flowing. Our tide and not trying to anchor on big tides so we don't have you know raging current and whatnot and right. we're on some flats that we're we're trying to draw them up off of the out of the hole up onto the flat to come find your bait are you dropping that scent down on a downrigger just letting it get down to bottom exactly yeah. in the old days guys used to put it on their anchor chain the problem with that is they go past you sure and then the guy that's up current might benefit from it yeah. but I'd use my downrigger. What we do is yeah. we, we put it on the downrigger mm -hmm. and you can buy those bags mm -hmm. and they're used in all kinds of uh, different pots. Sure. But you know, they're bait bags. Everybody's got them. They're either orange or they're blue. Mm -hmm. And we just clip them onto the downrigger, send the downrigger all the way to the bottom. Now I'm using a 15 pound ball, okay. get it to the bottom and bring it up 10 to 15 feet. And the reason you want it up so high is so that you can broadcast yeah. a greater distance. Some of that's going to fall, yep. but a lot of it's going to go down What current. are you putting in your bait bag? What's, what's your number one go-to slop of fish and you know what? slurry and whatever? I've got a bait freezer where I keep my boat in my carport, and I keep shrimp heads, mm -hmm. I keep carcasses. But one of my main go-tos and this is for shrimping too, I go to the dollar store and I get cans of mackerel. Yep. And I punch holes in them and yep. I put them in there and I put what I have in there. If I've got the skin from yesterday's halibut or last week's halibut, I'll put that in there too. No. Anything that's going to be good. I'll also use some of my shrimp bait. Yeah. So in my shrimp bait, um, you know, I'll have jars of it ready, throw that in there and that's dispersing a lot of bait quickly. Uh, but my shrimp recipe is a little bit unusual. I'm using instant potatoes, um, the cat food, the, the dry cat food. Mm -hmm. and instant potatoes. Exactly. It's a, it's a binder. Oh, okay. It's, yeah. it's sure. a wonderful binder. Yeah, okay. So yeah. the key here, though, is 100% Alaskan fish fertilizer. It looks horrible. It smells horrible to mm. me. But you pour that in there. Mix that in your kitchen, do you? <laughs> yeah. Mrs. V and comes by, home. You cook it there way. again? <laughs> yeah. By the way, don't use your wife's blender. Yeah, not a bad idea. Oh, not, a bad, not a good idea. I bet that's not a good idea. We can do it for a while. <laughs> Honey, we're going shrimping. But the idea, of course, is we're trying to get a scent into the water. Yeah. And the difference between what we call chumming off the downrigger versus not is huge. I've had guys tell huge. me you cannot bait or put scent out, put a scent trail out for halibut that is not on the rod or rig that's that you're fishing. True. And it's not true. Dispelling that myth right now, and that's why I asked the question because I know the answer, but I have right. people that will go toe to toe and say, and you it, cannot do it. And people are gonna still tell you you can't use trout. I know. Same right. thing. Yeah, we're gonna trying. tell we're, you that you can't use trout of salmon, but is there we, details we to the chumming, like a certain distance offshore, or no? no. Okay. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Find out no. flat like you're talking about. Anchor up. Now, I can well, see where uh, anchoring and putting out a bait and scent trail is gonna be much more productive than trying to do that while you're well, now, drifting. But you do it then too, don't you? Here's here's another completely different idea that I've done, and I've told people that they can do. We have shrimp season that is going to open May 11th. Right. Well, what is May? May is halibut. Yep. So 
During those halibut days, it's also shrimp days. So you could drop your shrimp pots, mm -hmm. you know, put a couple up ahead of you, and then anchor up. Now what do you have? You got your shrimp pots bringing Broadcast in shrimp and, and halibut. Yeah. yeah. And Two you don't one. have very far to go to pick them up, and nobody's going to steal them. That's a pretty good plan because you're sitting right there. You're sitting right there. <laughs> By the way, though, most, uh, most shrimp pots that are stolen, mm -hmm. they weren't stolen. They floated away. They yep. went bye-bye. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, utilizing our electronics, looking for types of ground or bottom contour or things that we need to key in on when we're trying to target halibut where they want to be. And also let's talk about, uh, if we're having a little bit of trouble here on this side, don't overlook the opportunity maybe to jump across the border on those upper north waters and get into Alaska, or to uh, Canada. Yeah, first of all, going to Canada, you know, we've got that form that you fill out for salmon. You don't have to do that. For halibut, you do not. You do not have yeah. to do that for halibut. I, I see that coming with the state because you know it's a, a federal fishery and there's that convention between the US and Canada and everybody wants to know how many halibut we're getting. They say they keep track of it, but I see that coming in the future. But right now, you don't even have to call Canadian Customs if you do not anchor, and that's the key. If you're oh. going to anchor for halibut, now you've got to call the Canadian Customs. And I've got all of this info. I just had a post this last weekend of how we can legally fish in Canada and return to the US. Mm -hmm. So that's on Halibut Chronicles. So if I'm gonna anchor in Canada, I'm gonna call 1888 Can Pass and I'm gonna talk to somebody in Ottawa. The problem that we were having last year and some this year, you call, you don't know who you're talking to, and as soon as they hear that you're gonna anchor, they say, well, you've gotta to go to the dock and clear customs. <laughs> well, I've got a Nexus card. I'm not supposed to do that. Because you're but touching Canadian if, soil? Yeah. If, <laughs> if they do say that, then yeah. what we're saying is never mind. Right. We're not going to do that. We're not gonna and then we'll right. just drift. Sure. Right. So it's about a 50-50. Okay. The other thing that we have to consider, you know, everybody is saying, yeah, you don't have to call U.S. Customs coming back into the U.S. Technically, you don't as long as you don't catch anything. Oh. As soon as you catch something, mm -hmm. you've brought something back because there is a segment in the small better vessel reporting system with Customs and Border Patrol that says, yeah, if you didn't go ashore, if you didn't do this, if you didn't do that. However, with multiple conversations that I've had with the reporting station up in Bellingham who manages the program, they say, we want you to call. What happens if WDF and W comes and talks to you after you cross the border? They're gonna want a clearance number. Sure. What happens if Coast Guard, what happens this, what happens that? And they've actually made it very simple. They have a brand new app, and you can go on Google Play, you can go on your iPhone, and go to the Apple Store, mm -hmm. and get the CBP, Customs Border Patrol, dash Rome app. And with that app, you have to have your GPS turned on, mm -hmm. and it will have a video chat. So you set this up, you get your phone, you enter your documents, and then take a picture of your documents. And if you were gonna be on my boat, I would get your passport, enhanced driver's license, mm -hmm. or your Nex Nexus card, and I would input that information, take pictures of it. So then when I come across the border, all I have to do is activate that app, and if an agent wants to have a face-to-face, they do it with a chat. Oh, well, there you go. It is absolutely simple, and they've they've really streamlined the process, and that's what they want everybody to start doing. You said something key there, too. I think a lot of folks, have you've been trying to decide whether or not you're going to go over the border in Canadian waters and, you know, try to get halibut this year, if you get frustrated not finding your halibut in Washington waters, think, oh, just jump across the border. you got to remember you either have to have your enhanced driver's license or your passport. You can't just go over there even though you call and whatnot you know what that's all fine and good but you still yeah. got to have those documents with you to be on those waters you're still in a foreign yeah. country you yeah. have to have those documents yeah. and where i live being so close to the canadian border i have a nexus card my fishing buddies have nexus cards makes it my easy. wife has a nexus okay. card so that makes it really easy yeah yeah so that's going into canada as, as far as trying to figure out where to go now right. like i said i look at a chart and i try to figure out okay what am I going to be fishing that day? Is it going to be an outgoing tide? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be an incoming tide? Or better yet, I'm looking at currents. Mm -hmm. Because in the Strait of Juan de Fuca especially, you might have a high tide at, let's say, noon. 
but the current might not stop running until two o'clock. Right. I mean, that's just the nature of the Strait of Juan de Fuca because yep. you got the Strait of Georgia, you've got, you know, Admiralty Inlet, you've got the Strait of Juan de Fuca, you've got all of these water hydraulics going on. Mm -hmm. And the best example I can give you is Coyote Bank. Mm -hmm. Sitting on Coyote Bank, I have watched, you know, boats that were within 300 yards in different locations, and we were all you know, pointing in a different direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes 180 degrees different yep. because the currents. currents are doing this. Good point, very good so point. So yeah. figure that out and you can get those currents. Mm -hmm. And if they go to the Halibut Chronicles, I've got a link on getting those currents, but you can get the Wagner's Current Guide and they have a, a book and it shows you according to the date that you're going to fish. You go and you say, okay, that's page 22. You go to page 22 and you can see what the currents are doing for that day and that time. It's, it's like a tide book on steroids. It's I mean, really, it really, really dials it in for amazing. you. Amazing. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing that I use, I don't know if David can, can bring up that, that photo that I have of the- uh, He'll try. The, the currents. <laughs> I use GPS Real Tide. Oh. And I can go to any of the tide stations and see the tide, but they also have current stations. Mm. So I can click on that current station for the day that I want to fish, and then it has a slider bar. Yeah. And it tells me, okay, here's, you know, here's a two knot current, and then it slacks off. So I can figure out exactly when I need to be there and what the current is going to be doing, gotcha. which is a big benefit. So when I'm planning my, my place to anchor, like I said, I want to have a down slope. Yep. You know, I want to have, you know, not much current if I'm going to be deep. And that's one of the other things that we kind of go by. If we're fishing deep, then you don't want much current. You can go deep. If you've got a lot of current and you're going to have those situations, go shallow. So how shallow? You know, if you were fishing in three or 400 feet, now try 200 or 150. It's mm. going to be a whole lot easier. Yeah. But those halibut are moving around as well. And this time of the year, there's halibut that are in the shallows that are feeding on baby dungeon ass crab. Oh. So there you go. my buddy over in Victoria, he's top guide over there. I'm in contact with him all the time. And, and he'll contact me and he'll say, hey, John, I'm anchoring and getting my limit in 30 feet of water. And I go, what? Huh. 30 feet of water? They're up there feeding on crab? They're feeding on little baby Probably crab. Down. And then they move as the so bait when you're, moves. When you're anchoring or where, when you're picking your spot to fish, are you looking for any structure at all on the bottom as far as any type of rock outcropping or any of that? To good fish point. Or? And we've got some good examples of that. Um, the 3136 hole. We've got the rock pile out of Port Angeles. I call those areas underwater hydraulic relief zones. Okay. So if you think about the Strait of Juan de Fuca as a mm -hmm. big river, mm -hmm. when you've got you know, something that comes up, mm -hmm. you've got water that comes over and it creates an underwater hydraulic relief yeah. zone on the down current side. Guess what the halibut do? Halibut yeah, have their eyes into in the current. Yeah. That's how they feed. Sure. So you could catch them right up on top mm. or you could have them down. And that downslope theory that I was talking about you know, if you're up here and they're down here, you're going to attract them to you. Gotcha. So yeah. you can fish up here or you can fish down there or you can just try and drift around like a lot of guys do, especially the 3136. We're not anchoring that because it is pretty snaggy mm -hmm. and people would get really mad because they're, there's a they're lot of drifters through. that yeah, go out there. Right. That makes sense. But those are, those are the places that I would drift. I would drift the 3136 hole. Mm -hmm. I would drift the rock pile out there. And all of these charts I do have on Halibut Chronicles. On Halibut Chronicles. Yeah, yeah. I think. If you're not uh, familiar with that, check out Halibut Chronicles because all this stuff that you have, you know, puked out all over our uh, the studio right now, this last 20 minutes, <laughs> is all there. I mean, I've gone there, poked around, and read it. It's, right. your write ups are phenomenal. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll go in the comments on Facebook and YouTube and throw links up. So oh, you there you go. Yeah, right. Barnum's on that. Yeah. Um, before we jump out for a break, because uh, I, I want to get through a little bit more here, um, let's talk about. Quotas this year, going into season here as we, as we crank up in May, we have a little bit more of a lucrative quotas given to us. By the macaws. The macaws are the ones that are responsible for right. that. But uh, in our conversations you know, prior to the show, when we kind of you know, stand around and start BSing about different things going on, you're not so sure that you know, halibut fishing is going to be all that easy this year and actually finding, finding uh, fish or finding an abundance of fish. Here's the problem we're having. There is a corrupt system at the federal level. 
it's Wait called the Commerce Department. <laughs> under the <clears throat> under the Commerce Department is NOAA. NOAA controls our fishery. Right. So we have the International Pacific Halibut Commission, and that was the first agreement, first convention between the U.S. and Canada. So this is a federally managed fishery. Yep. So the two countries get together and they say, okay, here are the seasons. There is a huge area up in Alaska that is classified by IPHC. It was designated almost 40 years ago as a nursery area. These halibut are three to four, five, six pounds. Guess what? The bottom draggers do not go by the same rules. Oh. Pacific, International Pacific Halibut Commission has no authority over them. Right. So we're talking about multi-billion dollar corporations on a multi-billion dollar fishery. Mm -hmm. So they go in there and they catch, I think it was in 2016 or 17, I've got this on Halibut Chronicles, they caught 335,000 of these small halibut. Wow. 335,000 in bycatch. Of the chickens, in bycatch. In bycatch, going for, you know, arrowtooth flounder, lemon sole, little little things that are worth 10 to 12 cents a pound that mm -hmm. they are importing to China and the Far East. And they have, they it's, use those as bycatch. There's no market they're using those for. They just toss by, them. Bycatch. Yep. But here's, here's the kicker. Bycatch throughout Alaska and the Bering Sea equals more than all of the quota for Canada mm -hmm. and the U.S. for sport and commercial and tribal. I believe it. Okay. Right now, the halibut biomass is down about 40 percent. Oh, it is. And that's why the seasons, the links, and if you're following what's going on in Canada, Canada actually got a boost over last year as far as the length. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Alaska, for a guided trip in southeast, you can only catch and keep up to a 38 incher or over 80 incher. So now there's definitely, I mean, so, slot, slot so there's slot limits. limits. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, now in Canada, it's a six fish annual mm -hmm. limit. And, in the U.S., you know, um, we're trying to go to the punch card system. We're right. trying to do what we can, but we really can't fix the problem until we fix the bycatch, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Well, you know, and your your information is always valid, and uh, you know, as I had alluded to early on in our conversation, I was kind of like, you know, I'm actually looking forward to get back out after halibut this year. We got more opportunity it seems as far as the quota and there should be a bunch of fish around you're like well hold on not so fast right <laughs> well, <laughs> so it's not all doom and gloom right it's not all doom and gloom but there, there's going to be some really good opportunities mm -hmm. the guys that are going to go out to la push and go out and fish outside of the sea closure mm -hmm. are going to have phenomenal They're fishing. Do okay. That is a phenomenal fishery. Okay. The guys that are, you know, out and around Nia Bay and, and the garbage dump are going to do well. Last year, mm -hmm. the big, big disappointment was CQ, Pillar Point, that yeah. major region. Um, that's the worst I've seen Well, we seen had it. some terrible weather days on our early openers, too. We had some terrible really weather bad. days, but we were recovering from the blob, and right. that right. affects the bait. Yep. These fish are migratory and we mm -hmm. talked about this pre-show yeah halibut spawn in 12 to 1800 feet of water so these mature fish mm -hmm. those are the transients those are the migrators and they're coming in and out of the ocean and they're they're going in the winter time because that's when they're spawning january february you say they have to be at least 12 years about old 12 years old. 12 years old yeah 12 years old mm -hmm. so these these sub sexually mature males and females you know, those could be what we would classify as residents, but they can move around. Sure. You know, these fish can move and they're moving with the bait. Mm -hmm. Early in the season, Canada's season started in February. I've been tracking what was going on and tracking the bait. It's pretty easy to do. A lot of bait, all of a sudden it went over to the east side of Constance Bank. Guess where the halibut were? Huh. They weren't at Coyote. They weren't at Souk. They weren't in those areas to the west, right. they were more to the east because right. that's where the bait was. And then that bait moved from there and a lot of it went into the inland waters and inside Puget Sound. I talked to John Martinez last week and he said, wow, this was the best Chinook mm. fishing blackmouth I've ever seen yeah. in my years. It all had to do with bait. Sure. And all of those those fish it moved in. everything. When right. the bait wasn't here, when we, we, we right. you know, fought our way through the blob of 2015, 2016, the right. bait was non-existent. Fishing was horrible, and we're still paying the price in some regards on our anadromous fisheries, right? But it's nice to see 
uh, locations of bait kind of reforming and, and redeveloping and there's plenty of nutrient balance in the in our oceans and whatnot to bring that feedback and even out here in South Puget Sound we're seeing bait out here in Area 13 that we hadn't seen in years so pretty exciting stuff. Well uh, the good news is every day is a different day right and a big slug of fish could come in yeah right before our opening I've seen it Port Angeles can be incredibly hot on the opener. CQ can be yeah. incredibly hot yeah. I've been there you just never know we are uh, we're running a little late, no big deal, because Barna, we set our own time. We really yep. don't care, you we know. Care. So we got nobody to answer. We got to. nobody to answer to. Well, other than our wives, <laughs> who happen to be watching and texting David as they always do. Um, we are going to jump out for a quick commercial break. Do not go anywhere. Stay tuned. We're going to get into the kitchen with Chef Kelly and Sherry. The recipe of the week. I have to read this because it's so freaking long. <laughs> pecan trust <laughs> pecan crusted trout over white cheddar grits with brown butter sage sauce. It wow. sounds a lot more complicated, I believe, than it truly is, as all his recipes. That's a tongue twister. It's worth sticking around for. Chef Kelly and Sherry in the kitchen when we come back right here on FHM. Everyone. Welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We're here in the kitchen with Chef Kelly and I hear that we have a rainbow trout caught by a little four-year-old on his birthday. Yeah, and I actually got to see that kid and he was so ecstatic talking about his <laughs> little fish. I mean, the smile from ear to ear was oh. just amazing. You know, that's what we need. Yeah. You know, we need, that's the future of our sport, you know? Exactly. And trout is found everywhere. Found most almost, popular. almost across the United, whole United States is one of the most popular fish. And so yeah. let's do one of my staples. It's a pecan crusted trout over white cheddar grits with a, a brown butter sage sauce. Okay, well, not quite what my dad used to throw on the campfire, but let's do it. Yes, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first thing we're gonna start with is our grits. Now, so let's talk about grits. Now, you know, there's a lot of argument over grits. It's like, what is grits? Is it gonna be the white corn or is it gonna be yellow corn is grits? This is a good argument. I tell you what, you're, you're like- Yeah, you're I hear like families fight over this. Yes, I, I, that's not a, not a joke at all. Okay. Okay. I'll trust you. And how they fix grits too is just, is equally as like- Yeah, everybody has their own way and they think yeah. that's the only way to do it. Yes, when yep. you put butter, oh, I put cheese in. <laughs> I put it all, to tell you the truth. <laughs> anyway, uh. so the basic premise of, of grits is gonna be Three and a half parts liquid to one part of your grits, okay? So just water, milk, and grits. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's start with. Okay, so we got our water here. 
Okay, that's two cups of water. All right. One and a half cups of milk, whole milk, I like. Okay, and then we're gonna season it. Okay, a little pepper, a little bit of salt. Kosher salt. Kosher salt, of course. Okay, I'm gonna green that Another to a boil. Another nine-year-old container. Right. That we love. Yes. Okay, so now let's talk about our trout. Okay, so what I did was I took the trout and I... You left the skin on. I left the skin on, of course, but I scaled it. So yeah, all I do with the scale is I just take a sharp knife. I kind of go backwards on the scale and then rinse them off. Just scrape them. Yeah, it's yeah. easy. Okay. It really is easy, tell you the truth. And then to get the bones out from the... Okay, the bones out, so filet. as you can see, I kept the skin intact and I just made a little V cut along each side of the bones and then just, just cut it out. Oh, okay. and I see it's not quite through to the skin. You just want it, you don't want to cut through the skin. Yes, absolutely. Okay. 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 So, trout is ready to go. All right. Panko. Panko. Always okay, panko. so equal parts, panko That's and bad. pecans. Now, our pecans, you know, I got some chopped pecans and they were really big. And oh. that's not what we're looking for. We're looking, we want it kind of finer. So you can see there's some dust in there. But, that's what but, I heard you pounding on. Yes. Yeah. I, was, I was actually <laughs> chopped it all by hand. Yeah. A slave or a hot stove for you. So if they're too big, they clump on there or they fall off? They just fall off. Okay. And it's like, okay, that, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So there's our crust. Okay, we're good to go there. Okay, so now we're going to season our fish. I'll leave that open for you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, we season our fish on both sides. Nice looking little rainbow. <laughs> I can't Fresh wait to see Harper's pepper. face with those, with her first one. Yeah. Okay, and I like garlic, so I'm gonna put a little bit of fresh garlic mixed in there too. Oh, ah, yeah. always with the garlic. Always well, with the garlic. Well, you know I like it too, so. Yeah, right? Okay, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. smear that on there, just like that. Looks great. Okay, now we're only gonna crust this on one side. Oh, I would've thought you did both. No, because what we're doing is we're trying to get crispy skin on one side and then the crust on the other side. Oh, okay. So you're getting two different textures, you know, out of one shot. Yeah. Okay, just kind of press that in there. Let that sit there for a second. You're going to get rid of that. Okay, our pan's getting hot. We're going to use a fair amount of oil in this. So that it kind of goes over the sides of it? And yes, exactly. And it's because we want to get... What's that word I'm looking for? Envelops it? Oh, wow. Big hey. word for the day. Oh, I have a few in me. Not very many. Mm. Make sure we get all of it kind of pressed in there pretty really good. All right. Yeah. Missed a little bit on the top. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so we're getting all crispy and happy in there. All right. okay. Happy. Happy fish. Happy fish. Okay, so our grits liquid is now boiling. So we're going to use a little too crazy. Yeah. We're going to use a whisk to whisk in our grits because we just don't want to have clumpy grits. Nobody likes a clumpy grit. That's right. You can take care grits. of that, please. Okay. Yeah, and you made some ahead of time because they need a little while. Yes, grits need at least like a half an hour. So, you know, bring this to a boil like it is. You know, turn it down. Okay. Down to low. We'll go ahead and move that one. And you can... You take care of that, please. Sure. All right. So, that's getting, well, that's getting a little warm. Um, a little bit of water. Sure. Um, well, that's getting warm. We're going to check out our 
fish. We're almost there on the flip. Okay, so there. while we're waiting for that, we're going to get our pan going for our sage butter, uh, our brown butter sage sauce. Okay? So it's just what you're thinking. Exactly what it says. What it says. Yeah. So, brown butter sage sauce. Yes. Okay. Okay. So everything is going good. Got that water? Yes. Okay, so our our grit's got a little bit thicker, so I'm gonna thin it down with just a little bit of water. Go a little bit there. All right. Okay. Let's mix it up there. Yeah. A little bit water. Uh, give me that butter back. Oh. Okay. Where did I put it? Right yeah. here. There we go. Also, just add some in it. Just add some in it. Mix it a little creamier. Oh, perfect. Boy. Ooh. Hey, now. Hey, now. There you go. Now. So do you just put a little pressure on there just to make sure that it sears it real good? Yeah. Okay. You know, sometimes it wants to kind of curl up on you like this, so you need to kind of press down. In the restaurant, we would take a, a pan and just put it on top. And there you go. Well, we're no restaurant. Right? One day a week. <laughs> yeah. Getting that butter all mixed in there. Wow, this looks really good. Now I know how to make grits. Okay, so. You know, typically you're going to add some cheese to, to your grits. Not everybody has cheese, but I like cheese in my grits. We're going to add a uh, black pepper white cheddar. But you can just use any kind of you white use, cheddar, mostly, use, is what you like. Uh, I just, you know, I don't like my, my grits too orange. Oh. Yeah. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. So we are almost there. Looks great. On our grits, we're almost ready to plate. Tell you the truth, okay. We're finishing up. So, see, we're there. Sage. Yes. Look so at that. So we're, we're going to add some sage to this. Not too much. It's not really high, powerful flavor. Oh right? yes, it's yes. This is not like oh, we're going to add because I want some more color. Some white wine. A little bit of white wine. We're trying to stop the cooking process. And uh, I was trying to add some uh, acid, so we're almost there. Wow. Mm. Okay, well, we're going to taste our grits. Make sure you got to taste everything before you serve it. Of course. How is it, Chef? Just a touch more salt. Touch more salt. Always can add more. Yep. Can't take it away. Oh, you know what? I taste that uh, smoked pepper in there. It's good. You actually like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was kind of skeptical. I was like, yeah, that's something different. You know, let's just try it. But I said, Chef, this is what I have. And let's, let's roll with it. <laughs> Here, hold that. Okay. All right. So... Get our grits right in the center. Real kind of almost creamy texture to that. Right? Yeah. Mm, we'll go cross hatch today. Wow. Doing this recipe just in time for opening day of fishing. Saturday. Get out there with your kids and bring them home and cook them up. Put a little bit on top. You always make everything look so incredible. 
Mm. I can smell the sage, you know, all that. It's everything that you want it to be. Everything. Yeah, you can. The flavors are just coming through it. Yeah. Mm. Oh. All right, guys. See how simple that is? I swear to gosh that uh, this could be, you know, $18 at any one of the restaurants. Wow, 18 bucks, huh? Yes. Not kidding. Not kidding. Oh. There you go. All right. Well, while we dig into this, we're going to throw it back to the guys in the studio. Well, there you go. Um, I don't know what to say about that one. There's a whole lot of things going on there. Right. You got grits. He's adding cheese. You got a brown butter sauce with sage. You ever made something like that? No. It's pretty darn simple. You what melt was? down some butter. <laughs> you throw a little sage in there right. that he plucked off the plant. And then... Uh, you, you slow the cooking process by adding a little bit of white wine. Right. But uh, that, is, uh, that is pretty amazing uh, to take trout. It seems like a lot, but yeah. he was over here a couple months ago. We pulled some trout out of the freezer, believe it or not, and he made that as we were practicing. Right. And I'm here to tell you, if you're not a big fan of trout, try that recipe. You can even do that recipe on steelhead. Halibut. You can do that on halibut. <laughs> That'd be right. yummy. I this guy, know. he's got a thing for halibut. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got a one-track mind. I don't know um, if it's because the opener is so close. So close. <laughs> so <laughs> close. <laughs> is your freezer vacant of halibut right now? I've got two pieces. I cleared it out. Okay, yeah. Getting ready. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, definitely a recipe to uh, give a go. Right. And um, I tell you, man, we, we lucked out when we landed Chef Kelly right, we on did. our crew. We so. Did. Yeah, hats well, off to him. Great job for him and Sherry again tonight in the kitchen. Well, uh, should I hop up and check the weather? We're so talking we trout. See? Got the trout opener coming up right. Saturday. Weather, by God, is going to be like one of the better opening day yeah. weather-wise that we've had in a few years. It has rained here the last three years, guaranteed. It's yeah. rained here on right. the opener. So right. let's take a look at what let's we got it. going. All right, so what I did here, I didn't want to start with that, but that's okay. So what I did here for Saturday, I pulled up Shelton, Washington, because Shelton, you know, the it's the land of a million lakes. Uh, a lot of lakes around that area, but I pulled up the hourly forecast for Saturday. And this is what you're looking at right here. You're looking at mostly cloudy throughout the day. You're going to start probably, I'm going to say you're going to start in the low 40s, and you're going to work your way up to the mid 50s. No raincoats needed. Uh, maybe a sweatshirt, extra layer in the morning, and then you'll be down to t-shirt weather in the afternoon. And if that isn't one of the most beautiful trout openers we've ever seen as far as being able to get kids out and enjoy a day in the sunshine to catch some beautiful rainbow trout or any other type of stalker trout, it's gonna be fantastic. What a way to break new anglers in. So we've been talking about well, let's go over here and click on this and just get it out of the way. We've been talking about springer fishing this weekend. We talked about visibility in the Columbia River. Uh, as you can see going into the weekend, the flows are actually coming down right here. You would think that would make fishing a little bit better, but as we said, visibility is going to be pretty much horrible in the river. Uh, from what I'm being told, three to six inches, uh, you're going to have to bonk a springer in the head with your gear to get it to bite. But hey, like I said earlier in the show, we can always find reasons not to fish. Just give it a shot if you want to give it a shot. Uh, now we're going to swing over to the coast. Let's look at these tides because this is just one of those weird weekends. Uh, I always talk about wanting to fish these smaller tides and these are a little bit in between tides, but they're still, you know, you got the, you got the seven foot one high coming off the four foot one low. You got three feet of water movement. That's one of these great weekends where with some sunshine coming, you think, man, I'm going to go get some bottom fish. I'm going to do lean caught. I'm going to do sea bass. Things are going to look great. I was thinking the same thing. Weather looks great. Maybe Sunday I'm going to try it. And then I clicked on the marine forecast and we got a little bit of wind coming that could stir things up a little bit. Saturday, they're saying we're going to have a northwest wind, 20 to 25 knots. Wind waves four to six feet with a northwest swell five feet at seven seconds. She's going to be a little sloppy Saturday. Sunday, it's going to lay down a little bit. Winds are going to shift northeast 5 to 15 knots, become a northwest 10 to 20 in the afternoon. Your wind waves are going to be 1 to 3 feet with your northwest swell 7 feet at 9 seconds. So it's going to be choppy out there. Uh, it's, it's a little more than I want to go out and do. 
but you know, you, you make your own call. The 10 day forecast all the way through, we're gonna dry out as we see here on our rain. Most of Washington, Oregon on Friday is dry. Northern Idaho gets a little bit of rain. And as we go through Saturday, it looks like there's a slight chance of showers up north. Uh, Sunday, predominantly dry in the entire region. Monday, we're predominantly dry. And that trend kind of continues with some showers in the first part of the week over towards Southern Idaho. But temperature's warm, spring is here. So many things starting to kick off. It's, it's starting to feel like I'm getting excited. Hey, things are happening. <laughs> I'm getting excited. Things are happening. By the time we get uh, you, <clears throat> excuse me, done with your baseball season, and right. I keep saying it because we're going to do it. We're going to go over and get our turkeys, I right? I, I think Dwayne's trying to hurry my baseball season as I'm trying I to make sure it goes as hard as very we best go. season they can get all the way to state. By God, if they can make it. You guys are, what, 10-2 and two in league? Yeah, ten right now? league so, right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Big yeah. games coming up. Trying it to helps that the weather. We're talking spring. We're talking the nice weather. Right. You know, you can get your games in, get your practices in. Right. I just get you here that much sooner. Right. Works out for everybody. <laughs> Works out for everybody. Right. Okay. Uh, great job with that. We are going to jump out for a quick commercial break. Stick around through that because when we come back from break, we're here live as we are each and every Thursday. Uh, we're going to be back in the Bay Lab with you right. two. Yep. John is going to break down some of his halibut rigs that he has, you know, basically built and created over the years. Right. The stuff you sell on, on uh, well, you sell it everywhere. Squidlures.com, halibut.net, linkcodfishing.net. Right. It's in a handful of stores up and down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's everywhere, right? So, again, if you're not familiar with him, that's right. why we brought you in because you are the right. resident expert on halibut. Right. We went in and previewed that stuff. I haven't done a ton of halib halibut fishing, but I've done a little, and... There's some stuff in there I never even thought of. Yeah, so ridiculous. This is gonna be awesome. We're gonna, you're gonna want to get your notepad out for this. one. we're gonna talk sound, we're gonna talk lighting, we're gonna talk UVs, we're gonna talk action, we're gonna talk everything relevant, and you're going to also show and demonstrate the UV properties and glow of your new salmon spoons that you're yeah. releasing. That These you are, are awesome. Not only excited about, but I don't know if you're aware, you're not getting out of here with any of them. So <laughs> we will be prototype right now. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be back in the Bay Lab with Barnum and John Beath right here on FHM. We come back.
Welcome back to FHN, guys. We are out in the bait lab, and we have John Beath here with us, and we are talking halibut gear. And, John, I've been halibut fishing a few times, really enjoyed it, but what I'm seeing here on the table is way more intense than we were doing. What do you, I mean, start us off with your favorite rig here and kind of work from the swivel down to the hook and show us what you're doing. All right, disclaimer though, you can go out with the most basic stuff and catch halibut. The difference here is we are trying to appeal to all of the senses of the halibut. Right. You know, the sound, the vibration, you know, their eyeballs, their scent their ability to smell. We're trying to do everything. Right. But there was a question on Facebook, what should I use, circle hook or J-hook? Right. J-hook, right? Good old J-hook. If you want to jig, J-hook. Okay. If you want to jerk, J-hook. You know, a lot of people like river fishing and they just can't, can't help themselves. If you're a jerk or a jerk fisherman, <laughs> J-hook. Right. If you're going to fish deep, a circle hook. Now these were invented by the Japanese, and when they brought these over to the longline fishermen of the U.S., uh, the halibut fishery in particular, right. the catch rate went up by 50 percent. Wow! Because the way a circle hook works, halibut comes up, gets it in here. If you jerk, nothing happens. Right. See that? Nothing happens. But when he gets it in his mouth, if you let him eat it and go to swim away. Now, look what happens. I've got it. Right. And we have to use barbless hooks. So with a barbless hook, a circle hook is a good idea because yeah. you're probably not gonna lose them. Right. So if you're gonna fish in real deep water or you get lazy and I get lazy because it's a lot of work, I stick the rod in the rod holder and I, I just sometimes wait for a bite. Right. That's not as effective. If you can work it, you're gonna always catch more fish. Okay. But you know, you get tired. Yeah. And sometimes when the bite's slow, okay, I'm gonna take a rest. Which brings up another point. A lot of people have their gear and they drop their lead to the bottom and that's where they fish. Right. That's not what you should be doing. Okay. You should bring it up four to six feet because now you have impacted more water and if there's some underwater obstacle or something, now you have halibut that can see it from a greater distance. But right. the other benefit is, if you imagine your lure right here, four to six feet above the bottom, that halibut comes up, he's leaving the safety of the bottom, he grabs that, what do you think he wants to do? Go you right think back. he wants to just mouth it? He grabs it and he wants to go right back down, right. so you get better hookups right. right. and more fish to the boat. Right. So get it up off the bottom, but every two or three minutes, if you're holding the rod, bang the bottom, banging the bottom. So let's talk about that. Halibut and salmon and all fish have a lateral line. That lateral line has tens of thousands of little sensors. They're little yep. nerve endings. It enables fish to feel without touching. That's right. how bait fish move around, right. schools of salmon. Right. They can sense the electric current in the water put out by vibration from other animals, basically. Is. It's, it's not an electric current, but it is, it's, it's that vibration. Right. Sound travels 11 times right. farther underwater, and it's five times louder. Whales can communicate by, you know, a factor of 2,000 miles. Wow. So one can talk to the other one 2,000 miles away because of sound and the vibration and how it works. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to bang that bottom. We're trying to do everything that we can to attract halibut. And we already talked about attracting them from a right. mile away. So we're using the scent, we're using the sound, right. and now we're doing lights. This is an underwater ultraviolet light that takes a double A battery. So you put that in, screw it down real tight, and you can fish this down to a thousand feet. We okay. also have water activated lights, cool. and we have these other little tail lights. Adding a light for halibut is huge because now we are making our glows glow better with a light right. source down there. We're putting a spotlight, especially with this one. I've got underwater footage where it's swinging around and literally spotlighting the herring that I have. The halibut right. love it. Right, and, and when you're fishing this depth of water, say four or 500 foot No, deep, even 100 feet. It's sometimes. completely black down there for the most part. Right, however, halibut and other fish see differently than we see. Okay. They can see into the ultraviolet spectrum. Ultraviolet is that thing that gives us skin cancer. If you've got blue eyes, which I know that you do, you right. should be wearing sunglasses every time out on the boat because you're more susceptible to eye damage because you have okay. blue eyes. Did you know that? No, that explains yeah. why I'm blind though. 
No, but <laughs> when you're out in the boat you, or on the river, you really need to have sunglasses. Wow. That UV is that powerful, and in the summer wow. months, and we're coming into those months, the UV index rises. The UV will penetrate the water if there is no plankton bloom or no mud in the water down to 500 feet. It gets okay. it gets dim, but in the the depths that we typically fish for halibut and fish for salmon, there's a UV index there, and that's why these lures really shine. So to give you an example, if we can switch to the overhead, you know, here's the UV light that I have, and this is all we're doing. When you put these lures in the water on a day with a, with a lot of UV, you notice, wow, it got brighter. Right. And that's what's going on. All we're simply doing is trying to have lures that can be seen from a greater distance because it's going to excite the fish. Right. In nature, squid do something called bioluminescence. Yep. And you know, here they are and if you look it up online, they'll turn colors mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to duplicate and that's why in my fat squids, this is a seven and a half, I have a little a little hole here for a light stick. So okay. we stick a light stick. So just a glow stick. A glow be. stick, and then it glow makes it glow from the inside out. Well, so we're just you're artif making, you're artificially yeah, right. making it bioluminesce because right. scientists have studied repeatedly how fish react to squid that bioluminesce, and what they've right. discovered is, and it's no secret and it's no mystery, it gets fish excited. Right. So you add that and good bait on your hook, and I always put some bait on my hook, unless it's you know, a, a Point Wilson dart, I'm not gonna bait that, but right. any other jig or something like right. this, I'm gonna put a hunk of bait on there because I want that scent. You want the scent. I want that scent. But let's go through a couple of items here. Yeah, let's do it. So here's a spreader bar, and a lot of people are familiar with a spreader bar. The thing I've done different here is I've taken an old, spoon and I put it on there. Without this, you know, it doesn't make much noise. But now, right, right. now think of what that does. Right. And this is just an old, this is an old, old salmon spoon. Yeah. Maybe you're not using it much yeah. anymore. It's a lure gents number four. Up. Right. You can use this one. Right. And by the way, you know, this, this has some good UV properties and it's super bright. And I've got a light shining here, but this really works. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I used to run Rivers Inlet Resort in Canada, and once a week we didn't have any planes. And I would go out to the ocean. So for one whole summer, once a week, I would go out there with four rods. You can use as many rods as you want. Okay. And I had everything identical. The only difference was I put a noisemaker on one. At the end of the season, the one with the noisemaker caught five fish to one. Wow. You know, wow. so. That's enough study there. Noise, right. noise, right. I like noise. Right. One thing I noticed on this rig up here, and you showed me kind of as we were going over this stuff, you've actually put, I mean, I'm gonna call it a hoochie for lack of a better term, but you've actually put it on upside down. What's no, I put it on the correct way. Right. <laughs> right. Years ago, Chris Batten and I, he wrote How to Catch Trophy Halibut. Okay. He and I did a project over a four year period. We spent about 30 grand. I hope my wife's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We, we had this incredible project of, of uh, beating Charlie White to, you know, getting the halibut biting the lure. And we okay. did. Charlie was a friend. I did a video with him years ago, but we recorded a 125 pound halibut in 325 feet of water wow. biting the lure. And we spent literally hundreds of hours watching. And what I saw with these, these skirts this way, they didn't get as much action. Right. Right. But when I turned them upside down, it became more lifelike. Yeah. And as that current surged, it became a dynamic bait versus a static bait. And it also, you know, just lays right over the hook. It doesn't get in the way. Right. So this is more lifelike. It's more what you see in nature. Right. And with this rig here, I've got a big old swivel onto that swivel, onto that uh, circle hook. Right. So when I hook the fish, he's not gonna tangle up my leader. Right. And it just works a whole lot yeah, better. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine that below the amount of movement that's gonna come from that compared to the other way. And oh yeah, we've got, we've got some bite. underwater footage, um, if David can get that up, because it just looks so good. Right. And the fish love it. And by the way, pink is a great color for halibut. Awesome. A lot of guys said, I don't wanna fish pink. But once their wife started using it and out fishing them, <laughs> suddenly they're buying pink. This is one of my top colors. But we try to have 
UV or glow in the dark in all of our stuff. So those are, those are some of the things that we do. We also will have a scent tube and this is in my Octo Squid Leader. Okay. And in that scent tube, we can put a light stick and then it's lighting it from the inside out. We put a little bit of a, a uh, sponge or something like okay. that and stick it in there, and put our favorite your, scent and it's okay. dripping over there creating a good scent Is there a, a scent, scent that you prefer over? Any scent is gonna work. Okay. You know, okay. any scent is gonna work. Okay, so we've kind of covered the gear. Let's talk about the rod and the reel. The rod, well, I'm, I'm biased because I'm the manufacturer. This is my Sensi stick, uh, Sensi Flex, and it's a six foot, 30 to 100. It'll handle a 32 ounce lead. Okay. And now I feature them with Alps Guides. Awesome. Alps Guides are the best guides, and that is uh, basically a rain shadow product. Right. right. You know, it's the manufacturer is in Squim, and my buddy Bill Batson, um, he got me into Alps Guides, and they're just phenomenal. They're marine grade stainless awesome. steel, but this rod blank is really pretty awesome. Hold on to that. It's sensitive enough on the tip. Go ahead and lift up. Yeah. Yeah. Fish on. And by the way, I should mention when you have a fish on a circle hook, start counting. Let him let him right. bend that rod down. Count right. to five, and then slowly start reeling because that engages the right. Hook. Exactly. As far you as do not want a jerk or circle hook. No jerk hook like we said before. So as far as reels, you can use whatever you have, or if you're really into it, you can go into a two-speed reel. Okay. And Penn's got some good two speeds. Okuma has some good ones. And as you go up in price, of course, the quality is a lot better. This is an Avid um, on my. My guide boat, I'm using Accurates. Accurates okay. are amazing, but it just costs a little bit more. But the difference is, you can put this in two speed and it's easier for a kid, your wife, or you, me, and right. it's awesome. I had Cabela's grandkids on my boat for a week. Oh, cool. I had a five-year-old catch his halibut every single day of that seven days, and he did it all by himself. Wow. He left it in the rod holder. But that enables kids to be able to do this Absolutely. without their parent you know, telling them, I'll help you. Right. They can do it themselves, right. which is really gonna be helpful. Well, I think that about covers the halibut stuff, but you guys oh. have a new product coming out you're super excited about, we're super excited about. Tell us a little bit about these. Well, this is my Easy Spoon, and I've been testing these. They don't have the hooks and the swivels, but they are going to come. Right, all sorts of different colors. Yeah, they're gonna come with a split ring on both ends, and they're going to have a swivel on both ends. But look how bright these are. Right. And these are all UV, and on the back, they are glow in the dark. So every one of them glows, and every one of them has the UV, and they are stainless steel. These are really, really cool, and I've already got pre-orders. I had to increase my, my order because they are, they're so hot, the stores want right. them. They're, right. they're so how amazing. long are those, how far away from market are May. those? May. Before, awesome. before our summer Chinook fishery, awesome. we will have these. And then next year I'm going to have another size. But notice awesome. I've got, got a few extra eyes on there. So right. it's pretty cool. And they go through the water incredibly well. Wow. And the fish love well, them. Well, we look forward to seeing those in the marketplace. And we look forward to fishing those because I know we're going to get a couple of them. I know we're I might get have to. But, but they don't have hooks. so Right. Well, we can get some hooks on it. For sure. <laughs> We're but pretty anyway. ingenuitive around here. Yeah. But. And uh, here's something else. The logbook. Okay. Write down everything that you can because there's going to be some areas that fish really well on an incoming versus an outgoing. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it's, it's important to make note right. of these things. Right. So this logbook has 50 data points. At the end of a season, you can go through your data points and say, wow, I didn't realize I do better when I use trout or mackerel, right, or I right. didn't realize that I did better an hour after high tide or right. during this current or whatever it is. And I can speak truth to that because when I was younger, teenager, early 20s, I kept log books on all my sturgeon fishing and we could literally go to the spot where we fished one year from the point we caught fish the year before and catch fish just like we did that day. It was Write it down. This right is available down. at squidlures.com. Right. I right. put this together. Here, you awesome. can have that one. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for the Bait Lab. We're going to go to a quick commercial break, and we're going to be back right after these messages.
What if there was a smarter way to search for your new home? Introducing the Better Homes and Gardens real estate website and mobile app. This revolutionary new search tool puts your needs first. Narrow your search to what matters most to your family, like school data, school districts, and even walk scores. Get easy access to your local affiliated agent, as well as unique and local insights about neighborhoods and properties directly within the app. With synced and safe preferences, you'll always pick up wherever you left off. Get your smarter search started today with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. We'll see you when we're all done. Hey, welcome back to the studio. Final segment of the show. You guys got the gift of gab in there. My God. I'm <laughs> yeah, down, we don't know how to shop. I'm out here trying to get a little work done, and I had to go close the door because it's just loud. I said, and, halibut season's this far away. John's excited. I am. And if that bit. energy gets me excited, yeah, I know. Right, let's go halibut Well, fishing. we're going. I mean, I guarantee you <laughs> we're going. And if uh, by chance you have a day on your boat, Yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna find your calendar and put my name in there. Right. <laughs> right. Maybe like, oh, looks like I'm taking uh, FHN crew out. I guess I didn't realize we'll that. We'll just be at the dock with a sign. Yeah. I, I just got my slip at PA today. Oh well, there you go. There's let's see, there's 20 slips left. Oh, huh. and part of that reason is there's a lot of guys going out to the ocean, so it's going to be crowded out that way. Yeah. I'm staying in. Okay. I'm going to go shallow. All right. Well, I like the sound of that. I'd like okay. to check out that whole anchor fishery thing. Great yeah. info. At the start of the show on that, really good info on your gear and whatnot. Pretty mind-boggling on the colors, the UVs, the noise, yeah. the scent, the light. It makes I mean, perfect sense. Absolutely. Right. Um, you're, you're tapping into all their sensories yeah. versus just one, right. of which most people do, scent, right? right. So, uh, John, you wrote an article uh, you released or put it out there on your Salmon Chronicles about 10 days or so ago. Uh, I read through that. I was like, oh, you know what? You have some very valid points here, about seven bullet points on what... WDFW in Canada is doing and mismanaging and screwing up basically in some regards are salmon fisheries. Let's uh, real quick before we get out of here, let's hit a couple of those bullet points that are really, in your opinion, kind of, you know, augering in some of our salmon. Well, once again, it's 
it's on the Fed's doorstep because in 2006, the NOAA scientists came out here and they did a survey of 16 Puget Sound Basin rivers and they concluded that 14 of them had extinct runs of wild stock. Okay? Chinook. Well, Chinook. Yep. So, they're extinct. What are you going to do as a fishery manager? Because mm -hmm. you want to protect your fiefdom and you want to have that power and that control. What do you think they did? They created the ESU. What's mm -hmm. an ESU? Mm -hmm. They said, okay, if two hatchery Chinook spawn, now they're wild and we got to protect them. Right. This is ridiculous. So now we are, we are faced with closures. We're faced with people that say, I don't like hatchery. They're polluting and such. But we could do one thing right away, mm -hmm. and it dates back to 1972. I was 12 years old, the Marine Maram Mammal Protection Act. Yep. Marine Mammal Protection Act yep. was, was put in, okay? And they made it very difficult to change. But guess what? Like them or not, we have President Trump in there who doesn't really go by the book. Sometimes... He just does what he wants. Mm -hmm. This is, in my view, the best time that we have ever had yep. to really try and get that changed. Because if we got that changed and got it out there, got rid of the California sea lions that are overpopulating, mm -hmm. they're like teenage gangs. Yeah. If we got rid of a bunch of the pinnipeds because we don't have enough transient orcas right. to eat them up, right. Right. right there you would save a whole bunch of Chinook. Yeah. Uh, we could decrease or eliminate commercial harvest of herring. What do these Chinook eat? What do other species sure. eat? But yet we're commercially harvesting them and over harvesting. Yep. We could eliminate all non-selective gill nets. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a no-brainer. We could force NOAA to reduce bycatch of Chinook in mm -hmm. Alaska because a lot of people don't realize that mid-level trawl for Pollock for McDonald's and, and and your little fish sticks at the supermarket, yep. that's killing off a whole bunch of Chinook. Well, the millions of pounds of Chinook they're taking in those long drag nets, those in there, they're, you know, two to three pound fish in a lot yeah. of cases, right? They're immature, uh, one and a half to two year old Chinook out there that are just getting swamped up in these right. in these nets and then just getting tossed overboard as bycatch. And it's millions of pounds of fish annually. It's you know ridiculous. Well, here's another example. Right now, they're trying to bring back the Elwha River. Yeah. And at the North of Falcon meeting in, in Squim, I ask, how come we aren't fin clipping these? And they looked at me and says, that river needs all the help it can get. If they fin clip them, we would get to catch them sure. under the selective fisheries. Yep. But they're saying the river needs as much help as it can get. In reality is, if they don't clip it, it becomes a wild fish mm -hmm. in management and then in the way they, How come they it's look okay at the river. There? Right. Yeah. How so, come it's, it's okay when it fits their model, but we have these groups now, and this is a great segue, into this whole Patagonia BS. We have these high fluent, you know, big money bag corporations that are jumping on the bandwagon that hatchery production of fish is the same as fish farms and polluting our right. waters. They called our Chinook from a hatchery pollutant. Correct. How <laughs> can they, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. And well, guess yeah. what? We vote with our dollars and I know several stores now that told me today we are going to take Patagonia out of their store. Absolutely. Right. How do you uh, provide a you know a line of clothing, for example, that is worn by those that recreate in the outdoors, i.e., fishermen and ladies and right. and people that are out in the outdoors, and then you come across as this uh, you know, one supporting these other groups, uh, Wild Fish Conservancy and and uh, Native Fish Society, and how do you jump on board with them? and say that, yeah, you're right, all this hatchery crap is pollution, and the only way to save the orcas is to bring back the wild fish runs. Well, they've been doing that, and the orcas are starving. Right. And it, the Elwha is a great example, because it's okay to not clip fish and let them naturally spawn, but it's not okay to broodstock in-basin genetics of fish that they've recognized now to say, in this basin, these are the remaining genetics as true as we can find in these strains of fish, okay? We'll say the Puyallup Basin, for example. They can take those fish, broodstock those fish out of that basin, and basically, within a hatchery environment, replicating these, what are so-called deemed left as native 
fish or natural spawners. You can do that. We're no longer talking about broadcast seeding, Chambers Creek, Chinook, throughout all Puget Sound. We're not talking about right. taking a single strand of steelhead and just throwing them in every river throughout Puget Sound. They did that 30, yeah, 40 yeah, years ago, right. and it screwed everything up. We've learned that it's created the imbalance that we are up against now, and we're not going to duplicate that. The end base and broodstock programs that they're slowly migrating towards have been proven, mm -hmm. and that's the direction we need to go. If you're going to buy off on this Wild Fish Conservancy and Native Fish Society and corporations like Patagonia, and you know what? Go to their websites and look at who their contributors are. Look at the yep. large corporations that are dumping monies into these out-of-state organizations, some in-state, a lot of out-of-state monies, California persons in Arizona telling us how to manage our fisheries, get rid of our hatcheries, go right. back to all wild fish because they want to save the orcas. Well, last time I checked, we talked about last week, there ain't right. a single orca Well, there's a Arizona. chart. there's a chart that I have on yep. my Salmon Chronicles. Good point. Yep. You have hatchery production of Chinook up here, and when it started to decline, guess what happened with the orcas? orcas they yep. started to decline at the same rate. Yep. But here's something to consider, and this is basically what it boils down to, and it's money. There is no money in fish recovery. Right. These yep. groups, they raise tons and tons of money from these people that have never fished, right. never right. been to the river, yep. never been in a boat. They're in the city and going, oh, these poor wild Chinook, yep. and they buy into it, and they donate, donate, yep. donate, so these yep. groups That's are using it for money. That's yep. exactly That's what all I was going to say is Patagonia, just uneducated, not understanding yep. the actual issues that are going on, having somebody from Wild Fish Conservancy or whatever come in, give them a spiel, they buy into the propaganda, they throw their name behind it, and it's going to kill them. It's going to hurt them. Go to Wild Fish Conservancy, go to Native Fish Society, check out their website, check out who their contributing sponsors are, do not patronize those right. companies and corporations. Right. Take Patagonia. If you have stuff, go give it to the Goodwill. Get rid of it. Right. Uh, I mean, good fire starter. Good fire starter. Right. It's your choice. But if you're wearing that on the river catching hatchery fish, it's kind of, yeah, that's up to you. You do what you right. want. But right. you know, as far as we're concerned, where we stand, uh, hatchery and wild coexist is right. the future. We're going to continue to carry that flag. We're not going to support corporations like Patagonia. Right. And uh, I'll, right. I was as blatant to put it out there as boycott Patagonia. I don't really care. They can call me on the phone. They can, you know, right. try to come have a seat. Yeah. I would, I would ask everyone, are you a fish racist? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> There's a lot if of you think on. a wild yes. Chinook is that much better than a hatchery fish, yeah. you are a fish racist. Yeah. Well, you need to get educated on the process. You need to get educated on... The broodstock hatchery production you need to get educated on what it truly means for natural spawn origin. Do we truly have native fish? We talked a couple weeks ago, Barnum. We've recognized in uh, literature that we've come across, 40% John of the wild uh, Chinook stocks that re that were here in Washington State are gone. They're gone. You're talking about the 14 rivers. Well, 40% of the native, true native genetic strains of Chinook are gone. Not coming back, like you said, right? So we have to take the morphed kind of genetic strains that they've created by mixing bags of fish over the years. In this basin, this is what we got. Right. Let's broodstock it. In this right. basin, this is what we got. Let's broodstock it. And let's yeah. stop bending over to the ESA listings and being handcuffed on how we manage our fisheries and not feeding the orcas and all those things. So we're kind of running out of time here, but... Uh, the seventh point is we have too many mergansers go. and cormorants. Yes, the we got to yes, take care of the Thank predatory birds. birds. Absolutely. Predation runs rampant amongst the pinnipeds and the birds. We haven't talked enough about birds, but we plan to. We're going to talk a lot yeah, about Yeah, we're going to talk birds. a lot about birds. Can't thank you enough, John. Hey, it was fun. Appreciate you making the drive and coming and yeah. uh, share a little time in our little studio here. Uh, it goes by quick. People are like, you guys do a two-hour show? Well, we only do it once a week, so we got to get... <laughs> it feels like 20 minutes. It feels like honestly. 20 minutes, especially when you're running in here late and tripping over cameras and all that. <laughs> we so, can't get half of what's in our heads out in two We hours. can, uh, though we try. So no. we want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. We're back here next Thursday with a whole new lineup, all new topics, trying to keep you informed. Interact with us during the week on our Facebook page. Go to our YouTube channel, subscribe so you never miss an episode. We'll take some of these segments tonight, break them out as standalone videos so you can also key in on those. Fantastic information again tonight, John. Appreciate awesome. it. And uh, join us here next week, Thursday evening, 6 p.m., right here on FHN. Let's go eat some trout. <laughs>